I'm going to talk about Brexit today, and particularly, I want to talk about the most important group of people affected by Brexit. Um, and that, to be fair, is a claim made by lots of sectors. We hear regularly about the importance of the right Brexit deal for the finance industry, for the fishing industry, for the farming industry, and they're all really important sectors. But they're dwarfed by the importance of securing a Brexit deal which works for ordinary families, and that's the focus of the retail consortium. We want the priority from policymakers to be delivering a Brexit which prevents shop prices rising, keeps availability on shop shelves as wide as possible. And we believe that's best achieved through a relationship with the EU and across the United Kingdom that maintains tariff friction-free trade relationships and which provides a framework that's going to meet the skills needs of our industry and our suppliers. I'm going to do that in four ways today. I'm going to first of all provide a little context talking both about why rising food prices are plausible and why there's a genuine risk, particularly if we default to the putative no deal, i.e. a relationship on most favoured nation status with a WTO relationship with the EU. And then I'm going to talk about the three priorities for our industry. I'm going to talk about why tariffs on goods inevitably lead to higher prices and why a tariff-free trade agreement with Europe is crucial. I'm going to talk about customs and regulatory systems and the points of friction which could impact in particular on food imports. And finally, I want to talk about the key role EU workers play in retail and what we're going to look for in principle from the post-Brexit immigration system. Let me start by food prices and consumers. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why food prices went up last year. Um, since the financial crisis, retail sales growth has been around half a percent a year. That's the consequence of flat economy and really intense competition, especially in grocery and food retail. And the response to that from the grocery industry was by focusing on delivering the lowest possible prices for consumers because of those pressures on, from competition. And we saw that from 2013 to 2016 with consistent food prices falling, making food cheaper in real terms than ever before. But that competition also had other impacts. It forced those businesses to innovate, to remain competitive, responded by becoming more efficient, but also by reducing profits to razor-thin margins. And that context is really important to understand what happened following the vote to leave in June 2016, because sterling fell by 10% against the euro and dollar. And the consequence is direct. Costs of importing goods went up because of that commodity price change. And we also saw global commodity prices rising. Retailers, of course, tried to absorb those costs. That's why you get a lag on the uh, right-hand graph between sort of the start of then up to October 2017, when we see this kind of jump coming through but it wasn't possible to manage. And throughout the whole of last year, peaking in October 2017, we saw food prices rising by 2%. That's the uh, BRC Nielsen shop price index that we're using there. 2% may not seem a huge amount in itself, but when it translated into ordinary shoppers' grocery bills, it becomes really significant. And it's particularly significant for those who are the lowest income households. They're the people who spend disproportionately more of their earnings on groceries. And we know Household incomes are under enormous pressure. We know what rising inflation has done, and that's what the left-hand graph there, which is taken from the OBR figures on household disposable income. See how it's gone flat over the last year and a bit. Unbelievable pressure on households from flat wages, from huge pressures across the economy. And to understand what it meant, we've got what happened to retail sales in the last couple of years. And you've got that sort of opening period where... Sales were aligned, the kind of top line, which is food, the bottom non-food, they sort of tracked together, ticking a bit under sort of growth, but, you know, not particularly terrible. And then we see that point around November, you see this big spike in food, and that spike is almost exclusively driven by food price inflation, and a consequence fall in non-food, and that gap opening up between the two. It's about a 3 to 4% shift, so it doubles the track. And that's been done because people don't have enough money to spend on things that aren't food. That's what's happened within that. People have been forced to shift their spending because there isn't any spare money about. And that exemplifies why we need to be so concerned about rising food prices. They affect everyone with the same price rise regardless of their income. And that's why food price rises are, are always aggress regressive. They always hurt the poorest the most. They hurt the poorest, the most vulnerable, the most deprived to the greatest degree. And those on the lowest incomes already face the biggest challenge, getting the food they need. And when they have those price rises, they can't reduce consumption. There's only so far a family can pare back the family food budget. 
Um, it means spending more for the same shopping basket or even, as we've seen, having to look at alternate ways to find that calorie thing. And that's the last thing we see. It means less money for clothing, less money for shoes, even cutting back on things like the heating. And after the winter we've had, that's a fairly terrifying prospect. It makes life for those who find paying the weekly bills a stretch even harder. Yes, there are other implications for the wider economy. It affects consumer spending and affects economic growth. Of course, it impacts on sales and jobs. But ultimately, the reason politicians should take every possible step to prevent food price rises is to prevent struggling families, sometimes in quite desperate circumstances, being put in an even more invidious position. And that's why we're so concerned at what Brexit might do to food prices. Right? That doesn't have to happen. It's not determinative. There are steps government can take to protect consumers through reaching a good Brexit deal. We've only got a year, though, until we leave the EU. There's less than three till the end of the transition period. <coughs> Time is not on our side on this. To move to the first of the retail industry's priorities, I want to talk about tariff-free trade, and in particular, how we protect consumers. And firstly, as a starting point, and to be really clear on this, we think that across the board tariff-free trade of the EU is the best outcome for consumers and also consequently for the retail industry. Um, just so we know exactly what to speak about, tariffs are the taxes paid in imported goods. They can be a percentage of the value of the goods or they can be specific, fixed amount per kilogram or so forth. And we're quite clear we think the status quo in our relationship with Europe is a good status quo. Continental products aren't subject to tariff when imported and sold to consumers in the UK. And the reverse is true for exporting businesses. We want to see, a, and alongside this, um, uh, this is probably a bit nerdy, but we want to see a UK generalised scheme of preferences introduced, providing at least as preferential access for developing nations as the current EU scheme. That's really, really important, both for those economies and also for our supply chains. And as the kind of graphic shows, this is particularly important for food. 79% of our food imports are from the EU, drinks, fruit, Vegetables and meat cross the Channel or Irish Sea daily to be sold in shops and restaurants. And getting this right is crucial. That's why we've called for an orderly and sequenced process on the UK government, renegotiating across the board tariff arrangements with the EU first before we secure new trading relationships with the rest of the world. That's really important. Um, the alternative is fraught with risks. We know a 2% rise in food prices had a huge effect on consumers. That's why I spent a bit of time on that. But as the slide shows, we can see much higher rises, particularly if we default to WTO relationship with the EU. Just to contextualise these, the figures here are calculated by stripping away all the costs except tariffs, applying them at the point in the supply chain and calculating the percentage against total consumption. And the differential range, which is in there, depends on how producers respond. So at the lower end, if UK producers don't change their prices at all, we'll see, you know, 5% rise or 6%. If it goes up further, you know, if they have to respond, as they may well. And these are really significant price rises. Even on imported products, we're looking at 5% increase in beef, 6% cheddar, 9% on tomatoes. And it gets worse, as I said, if domestic producers have to do more. I'm going to be honest, and I probably shouldn't admit this particularly in this one, I'm not really a big fan of broccoli, but it's going to taste an awful lot worse, costing 10% more. It's also really important to note, um, these tariff rises affect our exporters too, and that makes our products more expensive in these markets, makes them less competitive in these markets. That actually has implications also on domestic production and domestic costs, and that's hugely, hugely concerning for the very successful Scottish food and drink industry that... I suspect everyone here is very proud of. There had to be a map. I love maps. Um, what the map here really shows is some of the trade-offs. And this is very much a broad approach across these things. And you'll see that there's opportunities and risks. What I really want to focus on, this is about food, is that kind of circle of red in the middle. Um, those are what happens to products from the EU. That's what tariffs do to them. So yes, there are some options. There are areas where there are some opportunities, but in the short term, and especially in food and drink, I think the risks are really quite serious. And these are hypothetical discussions. We don't know what the final deal will look like. We don't know what all these areas might be. But it seems very likely food price will rise if we're unable to secure a food free trade agreement with the EU. To move on to customs and regulations, and it's quite interesting hearing actually what Ross was saying earlier, something I never wrote in this original draft here 
was to mention, of course, how utterly crucial the high standards we have in Scotland in particular, across the UK, are for the retail industry and our consumers. It never crossed my mind to put it in because it's axiomatic to us that high standards are what our consumers want, they're what our businesses supply on. And I think that's a, that's a really good point, it just kind of needs added in. But I want to move a little bit to talk about the customs relationship with the European Union, as the challenge is huge. European supply chains are a key part in delivering the products we buy every day. We want to see a framework that delivers as frictionless trade as possible for consumers. Most of the goods we're talking about and discussing in food are perishable. They need to be transported quickly. And we need a system of controls post-Brexit ensures goods can be imported without delays, disruptions, or additional costs. Because those will affect availability on shelves, increase waste, and push up prices. The UK government's published some proposals on this to avoid disruption to trade, but I really think we need to not underestimate just how complex and how the scale of the challenge we're facing. We're going to need agreement and implementation of detailed plans covering everything from documentation to food safety inspections. It's needed quickly to avoid disruption for consumers. We need more detail and planning. I'm going to end up in coffin, I think. Around issues like security, transit, haulage, upfront VAT, and mutual recognition of enforcement regimes between the EU and the UK. And our aim for consumers is not to notice any difference for availability of affordable quality products when they visit stores post-Brexit. I want to be clear, we're not taking a view on how this is accomplished. There's significant and, if I'm honest, interminable debate about whether the UK should stay in the customs union or a customs union or any number of other potential pre-existing frameworks. Um, for our members, it's not about the title. It's not about what it, the way it does. It's about the practical policies that are going to deliver friction-free trade. That's where our focus is. Again, <coughs> the challenge is really significant. Currently, four million trucks cross the borders each year. Dover alone takes 10,000 freight movements a day. But there's no physical infrastructure there currently for holding consignments awaiting customs clearance. If we default to a, to a WTO relationship, we're looking at 180,000 businesses across the UK being drawn into customs declarations, and those declarations rising from 55 to 255 million a year. That's an enormous amount. <coughs> and this is our, our customs roadmap, and I think it's quite a good way of showing it. On the top left up there, we have the status quo, the uh, single administrative document. It covers everything for products coming through. Underneath, we've got the tortuous, twisting road that happens if we don't get agreement on these areas. I will not, you'll be relieved, go into exhaustive detail on every single element within that. Um, but there are a couple of points I want to address and two big areas I want to pick out. Firstly, the UK and the EU need to reach agreement on, uh, agreements on ensuring goods can freely and efficiently cross the border. Importers have told us delays to clear additional checks for gas costs and interruptions to the supply chains. One of our estimates alone is a refrigerated lorry held up at a port costs £500 a day. That's going to add up very quickly when you think of the sheer volume and number of vehicles we're talking about. And new checks on rules of origin, new declarations, the most significant barrier <coughs> to the smooth flow of goods between the UK and the EU. We can ameliorate this by extending the use of the Authorised Economic Operator Scheme, which is a version of the Trusted Trader Scheme that's used by other countries and allows fast tracks. It's helpful. It reduces the burden of checks, security and tax requirements. But it's not a silver bullet. It won't work for all businesses and it won't deal with the challenge of infrastructure not being in place. Even if the paperwork is resolved, but there's a queue to enter the port, it still holds up deliveries. And let's be honest, if we're looking at, you know, without this infrastructure, without these mechanisms, we're going to see a semi-permanent version of Operation Stack at Dover, lorries littering the southeast of England. It's a, a fairly concerning prospect. And that's why we need to see the physical infrastructure built. That means investment in port capacity, roads, warehouses. We need IT investment for a new customs declaration system ready for 2021. And we need to look at, you know, how we do this. And these are not inexpensive things to do. I, I think anybody who's ever been involved in an IT project knows you can't do it quickly. 
And we're going to need other points. We're going to need agreement on VAT to prevent upfront VAT import costs, which will particularly hit smaller businesses. We need agreements on security of goods, and Norway has a pre-existing arrangement that could be used. We need agreements on drivers and lorries. And all of these will simplify the process and speed up imports and consequently keep prices down. And secondly, perhaps particularly importantly, we need a system of mutual recognition of inspections and regulatory standards with the EU. Currently, we've got a system which has a common approach to food safety by all EU standards, avoids additional inspections at port. Two key elements of this. Firstly, we could replicate the system of mutual recognition on conformity assessments, avoiding unnecessary interruptions to trade. That will reduce two sets of checks down to one, and that would be a hugely positive step. But it won't eliminate the need for checks. That can only happen if we have full regulatory alignment with the relevant part of EU law. Now, Retail consortium, the retail industry, hasn't taken a view on whether we should have complete regulatory harmonisation on every aspect. There's a huge number of factors in play, and you know, predicting what will happen in politics in six months, let alone ten years, would be, you know, make that difficult. But I want to be really clear. Any decisions on diverging public policy positions should be made in the context they will lead to a more onerous import regime. And regardless of these choices, there's a need for the relevant agencies to be coordinated. The UK Border Force, HMRC, FSS and FSA, DEFRA, the devolved departments. They all need to align their work so we get the right processes and they're all working consistently. And I want to make one final point to be clear around the whole regulatory framework. The focus of much of this and what we've spoken about is the relationship between the EU and the UK. But we know, and after Sir Kenneth being here, obviously, we know Brexit will herald a fresh chapter of devolution in the UK. And that's going to be substantial additional powers and responsibilities for Holyrood and the other devolved administrations. That will inevitably create a more diverse and complex public policy environment for retailers to operate in. Scotland's shoppers and businesses benefit enormously from the existing and largely unfettered UK internal market. It lets retailers capitalise on the efficiencies derived from regulatory consistency and economies of scale, reducing business costs, increasing productivity, keeping down prices and increasing choice for consumers. Of the 111 powers that have been identified that could be devolved, the majority will have little impact on our industry. But there are some areas, and food and nutrition labelling is the obvious example, where we will want to see the fullest possible alignment post-Brexit, devolved in UK administrations working collegiately on a shared approach to minimise duplication and discrepancy for retailers and others. I want to be specific on this because it's a lot of debate. Our focus is not on where powers reside. That's for the politicians to thrash out. Our interest is in the frameworks which will follow that need to be developed to ensure the UK and Scottish governments can work together to ensure Scottish customers continue to receive the benefits of the UK internal market. We recognise the UK and Scottish governments will want to make decisions which are different and indeed will want to make decisions that are different from each other as well as the EU. But these decisions, which will create divergence from the status quo in either of these single markets, run the risk of increasing costs for consumers and they should only be undertaken where there are quite significant benefits to doing so. Ultimately, retailers want to continue to run supply chains as efficiently as possible. The efficient systems which minimise waste deliver sustainable outcomes and lower prices for consumers. We're nearly there. I finally want to talk about the greatest strength of our industry, and that's the people who work in our stores and across our the retail businesses. Because one of the hardest things I've seen was uh, a few days after the Brexit vote, I was doing a store visit with one of our members, and it was heartbreaking to watch the store manager being unable to give any clarity or reassurance to the EU workers in the store. I'm really glad we're beyond that, but it was incredibly difficult to see and reinforce these, you know, are, are not some sort of alien kind of concept. These are the people who every day deliver for our customers and are a huge and valuable part of our industry. And we're going to need these workers post-Brexit, and we will need to <coughs> post the end of the transition period. And we want to see clear evidence the UK's future immigration system meets the needs of the retail industry and its customers. Now, our industry is a little different from some of the other parts of food and drink. Only about 4% of our industry, that's about 10,000 people in Scotland, are EU nationals. And our industry itself is going through a, a period of transformational change that's affecting the size and skills profile of our workforce. The number of jobs in retail will fall over time. Indeed, they've fallen 7% over the last eight years. The roles remaining will be more skilled 
and indeed higher pay. And when we're looking at the skills, there's two categories. We're looking for high-skilled workers and high-skilled EU workers who already work in head office roles, in nutrition, in marketing, in technology, all across the business, delivering. And these are high-skilled, fantastic workers driving productivity and improving our businesses. We will want these workers to come to Scotland to continue working for Scottish retailers, and we want as few barriers to that as possible. But we also have store-based colleagues, and they're going to need to be able to excel at customer service, at managing tech, and being adaptable to work in different departments at different times. The uh, old image, I'm afraid, of people stacking shelves is very much anachronistic. Um, we already benefit from this, and we're going to continue to need those workers to do so. And I just want to make a point of clarity, because our skills needs are different. That doesn't mean we don't agree 100% with the views of others in the Scottish food and drink industry. There are thousands upon thousands of EU workers making an enormous contribution to the success of the Scottish food and drink industry. And these workers will be just as crucial after we leave the EU. And we're going to need an immigration system which encourages rather than deters these workers from coming to Scotland. Some final thoughts. Hopefully what I've covered today explains what retailers are looking for in the final Brexit settlement. We believe it's possible to have a successful Brexit. We're an industry used to challenges. We're robust, we're resilient. We'll make whatever happens work for our colleagues and our customers. For us, Brexit isn't about anachronistic conceptualizations of sovereignty. It's definitely not about the color of passports. But instead, it's about how we build a new trading framework. And that framework needs to be put together practically recognizing the inherent benefits of regulatory alignment, especially on food issues. It needs to recognize the links between free trade, free movement of goods, and the free movement of workers. Ultimately, a successful Brexit negotiation is one which focuses on delivering practical, real-world solutions to our new trading arrangements. There's no reason it must fail. However, to replicate the very successful systems we have now is going to require collaboration, clear thinking, and clarity as early as possible. By doing so, by de developing a friction and tariff-free relationship with Europe, we'll see a successful Brexit which delivers for Scottish shoppers. Thank you very much.